this is the beginning of esoteric, not, I almost said it, esoteric astrology, Cosmic Fire webinar commentaries, uh, number three. And what we've been looking at is the, uh, the hierarchy is the life, the ray is the veil, the ray is a primordial form. Um, let's do it this way. Uh, okay, but I want everything to be in that uh, red, you know. So maybe we'll do it this way. We'll do it this way. Okay. Um, sorry. All right, so uh, ray is a primordial form, which uh, is uh, a geometrizing power emanating from a type of monad called a ray lord of all different statuses up to the seven integer gods, I call them, before the throne of the universal logos. All right. So a ray is a primordial form, yet it is a veil for a hierarchy, for a creative hierarchy uh, of, oops, creative hierarchy of monads. Uh, every ray is a quality, one of seven. But the word quality can be used in different ways. And one meaning is the degree of refinement or purity with which a ray expresses. The same ray, okay, I'll just go on. The same ray can express uh, with different degrees of uh, purity, refinement, uh, completeness, uh, etc. So the quality of a ray in this sense depends upon the quality or status of the monad or member of a creative hierarchy which uses that ray. Uh, a man expressing the second ray will express with lower quality than uh, a uh, solar angel expressing that ray or a member of the uh, divine builders expressing that ray. All right, so I hope it's clear now. I hope it's clear. Um, The, the 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 monad or the member of the creative hierarchy is the principal thing. The rays are the qualitative veils. Right? Rays are qualitative veils. Uh, through which the monads, which are members of the of any creative hierarchy, express and forms which result from the geometrizing power of the rays are even uh, denser veils through which the monads which are members of a creative hierarchy, express. Okay, better than that, I probably can't do. I just have to leave it at that with my apologies 
for what looked like a third ray mess up there uh, as the ideas came to me. Uh, but now we have something that is more systematic. You know, I've always pondered over that paragraph, and now I've managed to split that paragraph into many different pieces. And so, but each is found behind. And, and so I'm going to actually go over here and say, tree is a cosmic fire, but each is found behind. And basically just read it as it is. Just, just straight as it is. These hierarchies of beings who come in on a ray of light from the center are the seeds of all that later is, and it is only as they pass out into manifestation and the forms which they are to occupy are gradually evolved that consideration of the planes becomes necessary. The planes are to certain of these hierarchies what the sheaths of the monad are to it. They are veils for the life indwelling. Um, I'm thinking about these very great Rajadeva lords who are monads and who clothe themselves in the planes. They are media of expression and exponents of force or energy of a specialized kind, the planes are. The quality of a ray is dependent upon the quality of the hierarchy of beings who uses it as a means of expression. There, I think, quality is being used in a different way. The seven hierarchies are veiled by the rays, but each is found behind the veil of every ray. For in their totality, they are the informing lives of every planetary scheme within the system. They are the life of all interplanetary space and the existences who are expressing themselves with the planetoids and all forms of lesser independent life than a planet. Let me briefly give certain hints concerning these hierarchies, etc. Okay. Well, you know, I'm reminded of how Master Moria said at one point, we are forced, <laughs> you know, to to look at a big pile of ideas and, and uh, give our uh, approval. Obviously, he wasn't approving of the piling up of ideas. Uh, and he was talking about HPV at the time, I think. Well, we've just witnessed my attempt to uh, get into this paragraph, which has vexed me for many, many years. And here is my work on that, each sentence of which is going to build. Um, let's see, how do I? Is going towards the building of um, the more formal sequential points found below. And these are the formal sequential points. The ray is a primordial form um, of a member of a creative hierarchy, i.e. of a monad. Um, so the ray is a primordial form which is a geometrizing power emanating from a type of monad called a ray lord and uh, ray lords being of all different statuses up to the seven integer gods before the throne of the universal logos. Uh, yet uh, it is a veil for a creative hierarchy of monads. Every ray is a quality, one of seven. Every ray is a quality, <laughs> is. All right. I like to make some words bigger for emphasis, is a quality. But the word quality uh, can be used in different ways. And one meaning is the degree of refinement or purity or completeness with which a ray expresses. The same ray can express with different degrees of purity, refinement, completeness. The status of a ray, in this sense, 
Now, the quality of a ray, in this sense, depends upon the quality or status of the monad, or member of a creative hierarchy, which uses that ray. Uh, or is veiled behind that ray. All right, come on. I'm just trying to... Ray. A man expressing the second ray will express with lower quality than a solar angel. Expressing that ray in a solar angel uh, will express with lower quality than a divine builder expressing that ray, uh, who will express with lower quality than a solar logos expressing that ray, or, or a planetary logos, and so forth. Well, you see the possible frustration of trying to, well, I won't speak yet. Rays are qualitative veils through which the monads, which are members of any creative hierarchy, express. And forms which result from the geometrizing power of the rays are even denser veils through which monads, which are members of a creative hierarchy, express. Uh, I'll say further, being has no quality. But beings, according to their status, uh, and their function, do have quality, and may sustain that quality throughout their universal <clears throat> uh, journey. But, of course, there's the principle of amalgamation. You know, when you're a monad of a first ray and someone else is a second ray and a third ray, etc., and you all coalesce into a greater being on the way of return, that greater quality will overshadow or permeate the lesser quality which you had been working on. And then there'll be another amalgamation and another. So qualities are laid on qualities are laid on qualities. Nothing is ever lost but these overlays of quality from a superior being which you have become uh, override the lesser quality that you had identified as and with. So finally we will have the ultimate overlay which will be the qualitative nature of the universal logos. Of course, you'd have to compare it to other universal logo, and sometimes I've said they're non-comparable. Not comparable. If I was to simplify this whole thing, and I believe that, you know, many of us at this point would be simply screaming for simplicity, um, I would just say, there's one life, there's one mona. It subdivides in, in different ways into many, many, many lives or monads of different power and intensity. These monads, through the very act of subdivision, uh, begin to demonstrate quality because number is quality. I won't stop to write. These monads express through primordial qualities, and these primordial qualities are, in a sense, rays. The, these primordial qualities associated with each monad work upon matter, let's just call it that, and build certain types of forms which are qualified by the primordial quality. And all the different functions of the divided great monad uh, work qualitatively uh, through uh, the different primordial qualities and through the different forms which are ruled by those primordial qualities in order to fulfill the purpose of the universal logos. Did I say that that was going to be simpler? <laughs> Lives have fulfilled a purpose in the universal logos, and in order to fulfill that purpose, they have to 
work at certain functions, and each one of their functions has a certain quality. Quality is based on number. I've often said that quantity is quality. Once we start working in a field of number, which is essentially the, the field of the Raylords, uh, every, diff every different function in Cosmos has uh, necessitates working with different qualities, or every different function is a different quality. So I want to say that, uh, well, let's see, a few more things. Simplification? Question mark. <laughs> Um, quantity is quality. And uh, let's see, I'll do it this way. Uh, quantity, question, quaternary, no. <laughs> quantity is quality. Function implies quality. Uh, differentiated monads, differentiated monads, uh, working as or in or as different functions express through different qualities according to the function. They change quality when they change function. Um, they may preserve some sort of initial quality conferred by the uh, integer gods. Uh, I suppose we all begin with some kind of uh, most intimate quality, which arises because we become involved in multiplicity and number. The minute we're becoming involved in number, quality has adhered to us. Um, when the emanations of the universal logos become involved in number or as number, uh, quality adheres to them. But, you know, of course, I realize I'm kind of using the third ray here, or it's using me. And I just want to say that we are all beings who have certain functions. And because of these functions, we are expressing a certain quality, a, a, a differentiated aspect of the inherent life that we are, or that the one monad is. So we just have to realize we're the one thing in an emanated form, and we're working through certain qualities, and we have to use those qualities to fulfill the purpose of the one thing. Maybe that's as simple as I can get it. Uh, we are differentiated uh, aspects, differentiated units of the one thing, or the one being. Uh, to... Uh, it has a purpose, and in order for us to fulfill our purpose within its purpose, we have to use certain qualities uh, in harmony with other units using other qualities. Uh, the purpose of the Universal Logos must be expressed in terms of quality. The weaving together uh, in a certain pattern um, the weaving together of um, 
of different qualities, of, of primary qualities in a certain uh, foreseen, in a certain meditatively foreseen pattern. And we're engaged in this right now, all of us. We are units of life. We have certain qualities. There's a great purpose. The purpose is a beautiful pattern, a kind of a fulfilling of an algorithm with which our the, the, the universal logos as a, as a ray of the absolute is uh, endowed. And we're all trying to uh, interact in such a way, using the qualities which we have to fulfill that great archetype which is conceived by the universal logos and therefore conceived by us. So we are all uh, weaving and responding in uh, uh, using our qualities in such a way that the archetype of the universal logos uh, his um, purpose as foreseen pattern may be fulfilled. That is our objective. Okay, friends. Well, forgive me. <laughs> Ask your forgiveness <laughs> if I've led us all into some strange uh, land of confusion. I ask your forgiveness, but I do think there are some um, statements there which uh, deal with life quality appearance, really, and with deal, which deal with uh, hierarchy ray form. Let's put it like this. Life quality appearance. Uh, how about spelling that? As creative hierarchy, ray, form, or matter, form. Yes, um, I think that some of the things said here give us the sense of what a creative hierarchy is as a collection of emanations from the one monad. A creative hierarchy uh, is a collection of emanated monads from the, from the one monad is a, um, is a collection uh, at a certain uh, status of expression or elevation of expression of emanated monads from the one monad working through uh, certain rays i.e., through certain qualities. Uh, and further, through certain uh, lesser forms which those ray qualities have uh, built, have aggregated, built, configured. So it really comes back to life, quality, and appearance. Ultimately, we are all working through. We are all beings of the one being, working with certain primordial qualities <clears throat> and through certain forms which have been built, aggregated, configured as a result of the qualities we're working through. And our purpose is to so act, so behave, so interact, that the great pattern conceived by the universal logos, which is, of course, a pattern of qualities, 
can be um, configured, can be built, can be realized uh, in matter of all kinds, in matter energy. Um, the pattern of the universal logos, the pattern uh, conceived, conceived by the universal logos is to be manifested in um, qualitate, uh, qualified um, uh, energy uh, form matter. I'm just going to call it qualified energy form matter, i.e., uh, i.e., through all uh, emanations of the universal logos. So, the logos has the big idea. The big idea is to be realized. And it's realized through emanated aspects. Uh, the purpose of the universal logos is realized or manifested through emanations of itself. Really, there is nothing else. Even the Mula Prakriti, you know, which is the basis of all that through which the purpose is to be manifested, is itself, in a way, an emanation of the One who came forth as a ray of the Absolute. Well, I realize, you know, that I'm getting a little bit into... Um, uh huh. That's what happens when you fail to. <laughs> I have another computer going here. I try to record, but sometimes I fail to press the record button soon enough. The <clears throat> the great being has an algorithm. Came forth from the absolute, as the absolute in finitized form. All of this is going back to my book, Infinitization of Selfhood. And whatever it is, that, that algorithm, that speciality, that configuration, that plan, that purpose has to be manifested. It has to be realized, has to be created, has to be become. The, the universal logos, in a way, becomes its purpose. Uh, it, it configures its purpose within its own emanations. So the universal logos configures its purpose within its own emanations. Uh, the purpose is ideational. The configure the realization of that purpose of that purpose is Mm, is actual. And there's a difference between ideational and actual. But one is, in a sense, uh, more real, and the other is its reflection. Uh, the ideational purpose is more real. The actual, the actuality, is um, a reflection. Well, have I <clears throat> led us into anything that will help with this paragraph? The hierarchies of beings who come in on the ray of light from the center, uh, for me, you know, ultimately that's the universal logos, uh, the core of the universal logos itself are the seeds of all that is, and it is only as they pass out into manifestation and the forms which they are to occupy are gradually evolved 
that consideration of the planes becomes necessary. The planes are to certain of these hierarchies. You know, he doesn't give us all the hierarchies by any means. Not at all. We just have some. The, they just keep going and going and going. Ever more inclusive as we rise. The planes are to certain of these hierarchies what the sheaths of the monad are to it. They are veils for the life indwelling. They are media of expression. You know, you're never going to get an unveiled monad you're only going to get a progressively less veiled monad. The unveiled monad is the absolute. The, even the one universal monad has the veil of singularity. It has the veil of finitude. The universal monad must divest itself of the veil of finitude in order to become the unveiled monad. The universe, the universe is the veiled monad. All right. Um, they are media of expression and exponents of force or energy of a specialized kind. The quality of a ray is dependent upon the quality of the hierarchy of beings who uses it as a means of expression. So I've explained that enough. At least my view, maybe Master D.K. meant something quite different, but you know, I'm doing the best I can with it. These seven hierarchies are veiled by the rays, but each is found behind the veil of every ray. For in their totality, they are the informing lives of every planetary scheme within the system. We can go on and on through the universe. They are the life of all interplanetary space. The existences who are expressing themselves with the planetoids, he's keeping it pretty much you know, within our solar system, but obviously we could extend. And all forms of lesser independent life than a planet. Let me briefly give the hints. Okay, well that's where we'll... Take a little pause, uh, maybe. Um, what is here imparted is not new in itself. Maybe we won't pause. <laughs> um, is not new in itself. But is the synthesizing of much already known, and it's gathered, gathering together in the form of brief enunciated facts. So we might say much gathered from the secret doctrine uh, and other occult sources and tabulated, you know, so we can see it all under the eye and compare these things. Each of these seven hier hierarchies of beings who are the builders or the attractive agents now, that's, that's very interesting because, you know, it, it's linking them thus with the second aspect of divinity, are in their degree intermediaries. Well, they always have, always have a relation to uh, hierarchies above and hierarchies below. Hierarchies of being all embody one of the types of force emanating from the seven constellations. Um, they work through primordial forms derived from one of the seven constellations, which. Um, emit or transmit, not sure which, ray energy. So they are, you know, can you find a creative hierarchy that's not an intermediary? You go to the top, but you always find that the top is the lowest of a still greater system of hierarchies. So they're all going to be intermediaries in that sense. They're all going to receive from above and confer upon that which is below. There are universal implications here, but DK is naturally going to l limit us to what we can possibly, maybe, conceive. The seven constellations notice that we're not just talking about, we could be talking about zodiacal constellations if we're speaking of the 
manifested creative hierarchies. Uh, so let me just say, um, if we are, whoop, if we are dealing with the manifested creative hierarchies, uh, let, let me do this. Um, MCHS manifested creative hierarchies. Um, and that's a good one. And let me do another. And I'll do MCH. Or simply manifested creative hierarchy. Hierarchy. Okay. Oopsie. MCH. Oh, that's Moon Chain Humanity. Mm hmm. Well, um, okay. Let's see. So, do you want to redefine it? Yes. So, manifested creative, two S's. Uh, okay, Moon Chain. Manifested Creative Hierarchy, MCHH. We'll do that. So, there, so if we are dealing with the Manifested Creative Hierarchies, then there are seven zodiacal constellations which condition. But if we are dealing with rays... There are only seven. And they come from constellations in the um, body or uh, in the uh, expression of the one about whom naught may be said. So maybe DK simply does mean zodiacal constellations here and, you know, all the way from... Leo down to Aquarius, he is uh, giving us the manifestation of the seven. But from another point of view, uh, there are seven great constellations which are chakras, uh, almost like ray chakras, and the one about whom not may be said. And um, although we sometimes talk about the seven stars of the Big Dipper, uh, Ursa Major, as the source of the rays, from another point of view, they are also coming from seven constellations which are characterized by those rays. And they come, you know, because, you know, think about what the ray lords are. There are seven spirits before the throne of our solar logos, like the seven sacred planets. They are seven ray lords. Well, now think about the one about whom not may be said. What's the analog to those ray lords? It's seven great constellational entities. As I've been dealing with it, you know, uh, Great Bear, Ray One, uh, maybe, you know, we've been all through this. Uh, oh, maybe Orion, Ray Two, uh, maybe a certain aspect of the Pleiades, Ray Three, um, maybe the uh, Ursa Minor, uh, Ray Four. Um, oh, th this is this is difficult, of course. Um, our solar system, our system of stars, that is, our local cosmic logos, ray six. It might be the great bear gives us ray, uh, somehow, uh, ray five. Uh, Draco, ray seven. As usual, having a tough time placing ray four. Um, as I say, there, there are just different ways to do it, and I haven't quite worked out what looks best. And even if I did work it out so that it did look best, it wouldn't necessarily be correct. But definitely we've got uh, the great bear would be a spirit before the throne, uh, Ray One. And, uh, and as I see it, our local cosmic logos, a spirit before the throne, a Ray Six spirit. After all, Mars does um, transmit the energy of the seven solar systems 
of which ours uh, is one. Draco definitely raised seven from this perspective. Um, Orion is difficult to place, and uh, we have to wonder whether the centaur gets into the act at all. The, the, the Syrian system is, I think, the seven solar systems of which ours is one. But can we look at um, Sirius as in any way dependent, I I I uh, independent of those seven solar systems? So I think, you know, sometimes when it comes to the throat center, I pause, and when it comes to whatever the ray force center is, I pause. But the idea is that there are seven great constellational lords who are as the seven spirits before the throne of the one about whom not may be said. And we come to one of one of these cosmic logoi, we have seven suns, who are the seven spirits before the throne of a cosmic logos. And we come down to our own um, solar systemic level, we have planets which are seven spirits before the throne of the solar logos. But every throne is really a spirit before. Our sun is one of the seven spirits before a cosmic logos. And that cosmic logos is one of the seven spirits before the one about whom not may be said. And it's going to go on. Because that, that one about whom not may be said is going to be, uh, if you, you, know, you look at uh, too far. But there it is. There's the cosmic parabrahm. And you can just see that the one about whom not may be said, whichever one it happens to be, is going to be just a septonate again. It's going to be before, before a higher throne and a higher throne. And on, it, on, on and on it goes until there is a termination. There's just one throne, and that's the throne of the universal logos. So they're the ultimate integer gods who are the ultimate seven spirits before the throne. And if we think that our local one about whom not may be said is a one about whom not may be said, what can we say of the universal logos? In a way, it's the, I want to call it the pen ultimate one about whom not may be said. The ultimate one about whom not may be said is the absolute itself. And about that, whatever it is, really not can be said. Though many attempts are made. So um, every one of these hierarchies is always uh, between. It's always between uh, other hierarchies, unless it's the very lowest or the very highest. They are the mediators between spirit and matter. Um, through them, because they are monad, comes spirit, and uh, into the forms which they use goes the quality of energy, and that and those forms are matter. So um, they receive uh, spirit through the monad, monads they are, and influence the matter which has been built into form by the um, primordial quality built into instruments of form by the primordial quality through which they work according to their status, their spiritual status. They are the transmitters of force from sources extraneous to the solar system to forces within the solar system. What are forces extraneous to the, the, the constellational lords, constellation logoi, are um, extraneous. And so are many solar logoi, extraneous. So they uh, transmit these high, uh, high uh, ray energies and um, constellational energies uh, and uh, zodiacal energies into our solar system. Each of these um, groups of beings is likewise septenarian nature, as in, you know, let's say, i.e., for instance, for instance, uh, seven groups of solar angels. And, as the secret doctrine has told us, seven groups of men of different uh, statuses and functions. And the 49 fires of Brahma 
are the lowest manifestation of their fiery nature. Each group may also be regarded as fallen in the cosmic sense because involved in the building process on the cosmic physical plane or the occupiers of forms of some degree of density or another because on the cosmic physical plane. Uh, so DK is definitely speaking of uh, the manifested creative hierarchies and not of the unmanifested. Well, you see that that little abbreviation doesn't work because it doesn't exist yet. So let's make it exist. The unmanifested uh, creative hierarchies. All right. Um, there's a sentence here. There are uh, really 147 groups of fires, I suppose, and each of these groups is likewise septenary in nature, and the 49 fires of Brahma are the lowest manifestation of their fiery nature, so each one manifests through a lower 49. Oop, oop, what have I done? Uh, just going to make sure. Um, so, each one of these hierarchies... Um, mm -hmm. Each one of these hierarchies um, uh, CR Each one of these creative hierarchies manifests through uh, 49 uh, lower fires. Now, it may also manifest through 49 ray types and 49 uh, higher spirits. Well, anyway, there are these 147. If we consider 3 times 49, with um, uh, the, the fires of Brahma, the fires of the rays, and the fires of the spirits of darkness, we cannot say that all... Um, that all of these hierarchies manifest through the upper 49. But through the lower 49, with their qualities, they all apparently, all apparently do, and you kind of wonder, you wonder this, um, I'll just say what I wonder, you know. One wonders, nope, that's not right. Okay. Um, one wonders whether, uh, sorry, each of the seven divisions manifests through seven subdivisions connected with the manifesting fires of Brahma. So what's the point? You know, within a creative hierarchy, there's a lot of differentiation, and it's all numerically accurate differentiation. We have, um, what are the seven types of men? We, we, have, we have typology that is horizontal, typology that is vertical. We have seven fundamental monadic types of men, ultimately three. But we also have men at different functions. We have um, if the seven types, how would they be divided? We, we have seven initiatory statuses. They all have a different uh, function. And the solar angels have ray differentiations, of course, across the horizontal, but vertically uh, they have different functions in relation to humanity, let us say. I can think of five functions, you know, some of them embodied the racial forms of early man. Um, some of them are connected with the lower part of the spiritual triad and are in with the arranging of egoic groups. Um, so basically with the higher type of the, egoic, uh, of the structure of the egoic lotus, the higher aspect. Some are involved with the uh, maintaining of the petals of the egoic lotus and differentiated in terms of certain types for each petal. 
and some are connected with the uh, communication with the atomic triangle. Um, so there are there are different functions of these beings, and they probably just like there's a huge spread of evolution in human beings. So there is a huge spread in the evolution of solar uh, angels. I I would guess. Of course, when we talk about the solar angels associated with humanity, we just say the solar angel. But we don't talk about their divisions, their emanations, the, the, the status of the different solar angels. I suppose when any entity emanates, he, he emanates uh, different types of emanations, some with higher status, the emanation continues lower status, the emanation continues lower status, and so forth. Spiritual status is just another way of talking about hierarchical position. So these uh, different hierarchies are not monolithic. That's the important thing. And when we look at the fiery lives or we look at the divine builders, or the greater builders, we're liable to say, oh, the, the fiery lives and the greater builders, without realizing that there is going to be a sevenfold differentiation and probably a 49-fold differentiation. And when we begin to talk about rays, we're going to talk about a, a 98-fold differentiation. So that's all, you know, that's too much for us to handle with our minds, of course. But um, at least we, we get the idea. So each of these groups of beings is likewise septenary in nature, and each septenate is probably septenary too. I mean, when you look at the planes, you have the the seven planes, seven systemic planes, but then you have the seven systemic subplanes, and then you have the seven sublevels of each systemic subplane. So you got 343 divisions. When you might just think of a plane, well, the analogy is not exact, but you might just think of a hierarchy. But look at the possible divisions of these hierarchies. Look at their areas of functioning. We don't know them all, of course. We barely know what's going on with man. We can understand that solar angels may be differentiated, but DK only gives us a few of their of their functions. He talks about, on page 844 of Cosmic Fire, he talks about um, lower and higher groupings. The solar petries. The highest three groups will become major planetary logoi, not singly, of course, and the lower four groups will become minor planetary logoi. So he, he makes a differentiation there. It's kind of a vertical differentiation. So there's a, a qualitative differentiation according to rays, and there's a functional di differentiation according to <coughs> spiritual status. Well, friends, uh, Maybe you thought it was hard enough to follow esoteric uh, astrology and my own uh, take on that. I'm sure there are people that can present it in a more simple manner. But this is the end of um, uh, Cosmic Fire uh, webinar commentaries number three. And we're on uh, some page or other. <clears throat> Let me find it. One, two, three. Well, we haven't made a whole lot of progress, so we can't be very far. Um, hmm. Eleven ninety-seven, I suppose. On page eleven ninety-seven, I, I do want to straighten this out. I, I hate those footnotes that just. Uh, there, there we go. So. Um, page 1196, and we, beginning of uh, a Cosmic Fire <coughs> webinar commentaries, number four, page 1196 is what we desire here. Well, now he's going to get into these hierarchies of lives, hierarchies of monads, working through certain primordial qualities at a certain status of spiritual evolution 
and therefore having a certain function and working through certain forms determined by the function which they are upholding and by the uh, primordial ray energies through which they are working. And we will see, you know, if we can understand a little something about these functions, R bearing in mind that we really are not looking at the whole gamut of monads or hierarchical lives, the divisibility of the monad. We are not coming anywhere near it. The divisibility of the monad and the reamalgamation of the apparently divided monadic emanations. This is the whole theme of creation. We're just going to look at some local lives in our, in relation to our local solar system and within the one about whom naught may be said, and they will have certain functions, which most mostly most of which we will not understand, with any degree of depth, and they have a certain interrelationship, and they are in an intermediate relation, intermediary relationship with each other. Every uh, uh, every creative hierarchy being, as it were. Um, the intermediary between the one or ones above and the one or ones below. Man, we know, will uh, mediate uh, in relation to the lower creative hierarchies and the lower kingdoms, and will be um, an agent of expression of higher creative hierarchies. So always there is a relationship between, until we go so low that and I'm not even saying that the lowest is really on this chart. I mean, there are there are probably groups that uh, are no longer the focus in this second ray <coughs> solar system. And when you ascend so high into the cosmos that all of this begins to be meaningless, then we cannot um, talk about these uh, higher functions. But we don't have to worry about that. We just get the idea that the extension is possible until we reach the very highest three of our solar system. Is that a creative hierarchy? Is that a monad? Well, it is. It is a. It is a monad in three, a one in three, and then we go to the father mother of the universe. Is that a monad? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the monad in two, and then we go to the absolute unity. Is that is that a monad? Is that a creative hierarchy? Hmm. I meant to ask, is that a creative hierarchy? Is the, is the universal trinity a, a, a creative hierarchy? Well, not in the sense we're describing it here, but of course is responsible for impulsing creation. The three and one, the two and one, and the one. Maybe we cannot, you know. The one is the one, and it is, it is as the hyparxis, I think they call it that, you know, the top of the pyramid. Uh, it's the hypoxis of everything. And uh, in a way it contains all monads, or all potential subdivisions, however, all of them as one. And we can't really call it a creative hierarchy. So we'll, we'll stick closer to home and deal with those groups of monads who are um, influential in building the uh, solar system and the local cosmos as we know it. That's what we will do. All righty. Well, it's been a trip going way out there, you know, trying to think of these things and always missing things, of course. <sighs> Each group may also be regarded as fallen in the cosmic sense because involved in the building process upon the cosmic physical plane, or as occupiers of forms. Occupiers. Isn't that an interesting word? Present within, permeating uh, lower groups of lives who are the constituent vehicles, the vehicles pulled together under the magnetic geometrizing power of the uh, ray most closely associated with any particular monad or group of monads. We'll let this go now. I'm a little tenacious. I have trouble letting go, you know, but okay, we'll let it go. And realize that Rome wasn't built in a day, and the causal body wasn't built in a day, and we were not built in a day, and 
I will just um, let this pass and we'll move on further to discussion of creative hierarchy number one. Okay, friends, see you soon. <laughs>